Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church Wednesday Evening Bible Study for Wednesday, November 8th, 2023. We are in the book of Colossians, the third chapter. Let's start in verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, for Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is adultery. idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is renewed in knowledge in the image of the Creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all, and is in all. Now, Paul is talking about how we should live. And he's not talking about a moral code of here's what's right and wrong, but he's talking about what should come out of our heart. And because if we have the love of Christ in us, we will have these moral things, these good things coming out of our heart, and we won't have these immoral and wrong things coming out of our heart. And, you know, so he's giving us not specifics, but generalities. And, um, you know, you're, you're to set your heart on things above, or what is above. It's the heavenly things, it's the eternal things, it is the things that have to do with the kingdom. So things like, you know, worshiping God, praising God, thanking God, being grateful for what he's given us, uh, studying his word, praying to him, making requests to him, uh, telling others the good news that Jesus is uh, the way to eternity, the way to forgiveness of sin. Uh, it is fellowshipping with fellow believers. It is coordinating together in an organization, the church, to do the work of the kingdom, uh, to do the work of the church. It is listening to your spiritual authorities, the pastors and other ministers that are with you, and uh, there to build you up and encourage you. Uh, you know, it's all those things. It's not a moral code that you have to attend church. It's not a moral code that you have to share the gospel. It is not a moral code that you have to worship God. Now, in the Old Testament, yes, it was given as a moral code, and you were supposed to worship Yahweh and Yahweh only and not worship other gods. You weren't to worship him in certain ways, such as building idols are building altars in the wrong place and appointing people that weren't uh, from the priestly line to be priests. You know, that's because those were the practices of the people around them and God was trying to get them to change their behavior. They'd been in Egypt, they were now out in Sinai and they were going to head to the promised land in Egypt, they were, anybody could be appointed priest, and very often were. And in Canaan, almost anybody was appointed priest, and you built an altar wherever you felt like it, very often on the top of a hill where it was very visible, and everybody knew you were worshiping whatever god that you worshiped there. And God was telling them, to not do the common practices that were around. In the New Testament, the similar kind of thing 
the, when the Jerusalem Council in Acts told the Gentiles, don't eat meat from strangled animals, don't eat uh, the blood in the meat, don't eat uh, meat has been offered to idols, to pagan gods. And that was the equivalent. And they weren't doing it as a moral code per se, but as if you are worshiping Jesus and him alone, you're not going to be doing these other things. It's not that they were thinking that putting having blood in your meat uh, was somehow uh, immoral or uh, going to negatively affect your life or your spiritual life. It's that those kind of things came from worshiping those false gods and worshiping those false gods would negatively impact your life. Here, Paul is talking to Colossians and says, put together uh, to death your earthly nature. And uh, that's the way we've lived before we became Christian. And uh, he mentions some of the big ones, immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, um, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, lying. Uh, you know, yeah, in one sense you can build a moral code around those kind of things, and most societies do, and most groups do. What we've got to be careful is not take this passage where in Colossians and in Galatians he was saying the moral code does not do you any spiritual good, and then building another moral code off of the things he's trying to get us to generalize and think about, as a new set of rules. It's not that they are a new morality. It's that if you have put off the old nature, or at least attempting to, these things will diminish in your life and become uh, at least apparently non-existent. You won't be known as being an adulterer. You won't be known as being sexually immoral. You won't be known as a liar. You won't be knowing for being known for having outbursts of anger. You'll be known for self-control. You'll be known for love. You'll be known for doing what's right for the other fellow and uh, putting their needs ahead of your own and serving them. And it's not that that's a moral code that you should serve others and do it it's just going to come out of your nature. And you have to realize that Jesus' death on the cross put to death that sinful nature. Yes, as long as we live on this life, the deceiver will deceive us. We will still be tempted. We will still be uh, even deceived occasionally. We will still come short and not have the full glory of God, which is his perfection, his correctness. But we will, th those will diminish in our life, and our normal existence will be without them. And we won't dwell on them, and we won't try to build them up. I know people who spend a lot of time trying to plan how they're going to get revenge on somebody else for their slights, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that kind of person is very dangerous because when you're seeking revenge, you're going to actually go beyond what uh, damage was done to you to punish the other. And uh, you're not righteous enough to know what's the right punishment, the right way of correcting them. And you're not going to be doing it for discipline. You're going to be doing it for preventive nature. And that uh, leads to revenge and return. And just you end up in a downward spiral. spiral. And uh, both people attacking each other and tearing each other up. It is so much harder to build up and to cooperate and to build Anybody can destroy, and destroying is way too easy. 
It's that building each other up, encouraging each other, helping each other toward each other's goals. That is hard. It takes intentionality. It takes work. It takes dedication. Loving the other has to be intentional. And that's what he's telling you to do. And if you look at it, the fruits of the Spirit, he's telling you the opposite of the fruits of the Spirit is what to avoid. So what he's trying to tell you in an indirect way is have the fruits of the Spirit. Peace, love, joy, etc. Righteousness, self-control. You know, um, they're going to fill you and that's what's going to be spilling out. Oh, he's having them intellectually understand that they should resist these evil desires that are in their hearts and actively work to put on the spirit filled life, the fruits of the spirit. And, um, you know, he says, yeah, you used to walk in that way before you were a Christian. But now, you're going to walk in a new way, the Christian way, the Christ way, the way Christ did things. And you're not going to worry so much about the effects on this earth. You know, yeah. we have to put on that new self to be renewed. And we're also to take off the artificial... Uh, divisions that are between us. You know, and he used the major divisions that were in uh, Colossae at that time. Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. You know, in today's society, we might say black, white, Hispanic, rich, poor, uh, educated, uneducated, um, foreign-born, native-born, uh, Texan versus non-Texan. You know, there's all kinds of those divisions. You know, and we should encourage each other. If you're in Christ and the other person is in Christ, it doesn't matter whether they're family, friends, people you know in our church, uh, neighbors, co-workers, uh, a stranger you meet and you learn that they're a believer. They should be treated with all with equal respect. They should be, uh, you should be seeing what you can do to meet their needs, to fellowship with them, to cooperate with them. And it's got to be intentional. You don't accidentally practice love. You don't accidentally practice good. It takes effort. And it's going to take effort. And there's going to be times when the deceiver, the tempter, comes up and says, you should be angry about this. Well, yeah, maybe... It is something that's broken your values, and anger is an appropriate response. But, as Paul says elsewhere, in your anger, do not sin. Do not think about revenge or uh, uh, dwell on the offense that's given. You've got to forgive them and go forward. You have to not plan how to do violence. Not plan how to... Uh, tear them down. You have to, when you're tempted to do it, when you realize you're doing it, stop dwelling on it and say, Lord, I forgive them. You deal with them. I'm going to try to picture how to love them, how to treat them correctly. And then when you do that, then you can go out and love them with the love of Christ 
and draw them into the kingdom. And if that doesn't win them over, then basically nothing will. Yes, you do have to tell them the good news of Jesus, that he can forgive sin. And there's no other forgiveness in, in earth, heaven and earth, except for the forgiveness of sin in Jesus. No other name. Verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This list he's giving here is very similar to the fruit of the Spirit he gives in Galatians. Some of the same topics are there. He's getting at the same concept. And he's writing this to them that they should be putting on the fruit of the Spirit. And it's something that he's... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Again, excuse me. Um, you know, we're going to have to intentionally do this. Yes, it will come about by the influence of the Holy Spirit on us, and the fruit of the Spirit will indwell us, uh, will come out of us because the Holy Spirit's in us. The, the Holy Spirit will convict us to do it. But we also have to actively cooperate with the Holy Spirit to display it. Now, the Holy Spirit can prompt us enough to we'll start displaying it without intentionality but we won't get there as fast. We won't get there as complete. The only people I have ever seen that seem to mature very fast without studying scripture, understanding what they should do, and trying to put it on were illiterate and couldn't study scripture, and they could only listen to what the preacher said. And then I think the Holy Spirit worked in them specially to convict them and have them do what was right. It's kind of the exception, not the rule here in America. Now that said, I understand that in some parts of the world where literacy is very low, that when uh, the gospel is preached and the Holy Spirit comes on the people, they rapidly change and they start expressing the fruit of the Spirit. In some ways, our learning gives us a curse that we have to be more intentional. We have to actively subjugate our will to the Holy Spirit. And he starts that passage by telling us we are deeply loved. God loved us enough he sent his son. He loved us enough that he sent his Holy Spirit to indwell us. He loved us enough that he recorded scripture so that we could read it and understand what he wanted and apply it to ourselves. And in the middle of that passage, he says, forgive as Christ has forgiven you. And every time I read that, I'm reminded of the parable that Jesus told me, actually several different parables, very similar, uh, where there was the rich man that had two servants. Uh, one of them owed just a little bit. One of them owed a huge amount, more than he could ever earn in his lifetime. And the master called them both in and says, pay up, and they pleaded. And the one who owed a whole bunch, he forgave it. He forgave the small amount to the small man. He gave, forgave the great amount. 
And then the one that had been forgiven much goes out and throws a man into prison for just pennies into debtor's prison and basically ruins his life over it. And then the master takes and executes that servant, causing the wicked servant in the parable of Jesus' death. Because he would not forgive a small debt. Now, I know that I have been forgiven much, and I find it easy to forgive offenses against me. Because I have been forgiven so much, uh, it's easy to forgive. You should also forgive. And particularly those close to you. If they're close to you and you deal with them all the time, you need to be displaying the fruit of the Spirit to them. Being that good witness for how Christ has changed you and forgive them in turn. It doesn't matter whether it's a big uh, offense or a small offense. Um, forgiveness is forgiveness. We've been forgiven everything. How much more should we forgive people parts of things? You know, that should come as a second nature. And when we start forgiving people, it's going to be harder to hold grudges and be angry and all the things he said not to do. You'll naturally want to do what's best for them, love them, and provide for them, and talk well to them. You won't have evil talk. You won't have coarse talk. You won't have jesting and demeaning talk. You won't intentionally hurt their feelings. And then he says, on top of all these virtues, put on love, doing the best for the other, um, which will bind us all into perfect unity. If we love each other, we will be unified because that's the natural response to love. If you're loving me and I'm loving you and we're doing what's best for each other <coughs> and we're applying wisdom to it, we're going to naturally be drawn to each other. That's the nature of that. Verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And what, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to, the God, to God the Father through him. So we're to put on the virtue of love, and we're to live in peace, and we are to cooperate with all the other members of the, of the church, and dwell together, loving each other. Um, you know, yeah, we're going to teach the Word of God. We're going to dwell on it. We're going to practice it. We're going to admonish each other. We're going to polish each other as, you know, steel sharpens steel. Um, you know, yes, we're going to do all those things. We're going to praise God. We're going to sing hymns and songs and uh, read scripture and all those other things we do as we worship and as we praise God. We're going to pray. We're going to study God's word. And he says, and whatever you do in word or deed, whether you speak or whether you act, and the word and the deed should match. 
I mean, I hate to have to make it explicit and make it obvious, but it's there. I mean, we, we should be unified in what we do and say. We should uh, speak civilly to each other, speak good into each other's life, and then practice doing that good to each other. Do it all in the name of Jesus Christ. Within the church, everything we do, within your life, when you work, when you go to the grocery store, when you drive on the street or the highway, when you go out and do your yard work, when you clean house, you should be doing it for Christ as Christ would have you do it. Does he want you being sloppy uh, cleaning the kitchen? No. That's why he gave in the Old Testament sanitation rules. He wanted you to live a sanitary life. Now, we, we understand sanitation and the purpose of it, and we know it's not a spiritual aspect that, that it affects this life, but let's face it, it affects everybody who might eat what you cook or what you you know, the clothes that you clean, or, you know, it, it will affect how your property is, and how your neighbors perceive you, and etc. So, you know, you don't have to be cynical about keeping the mo yard mowed every three days, and edged every other day, or anything like that, and, you know, every bush being picture perfect it, 365 days a year. Um, that's uh, the way that's practiced in this life. Uh, that's just showing out and uh, calling attention to yourself. He doesn't mind growing things growing the way they, that he designed them to grow. That's why he made them to grow that way. On the other hand, we also live in community and we shouldn't let weeds be, you know, chest high in our yard and vermin be running through and, you know, uh, contaminating everybody's house around them because you're the source of the, you know, rats or the mice or the skunks or whatever. Uh, you know, you should keep it up so that it's presentable. You don't have to be just absolutely cynical about it. Uh, You know, depending upon growing conditions, and only once a month may be enough. You don't have to slave away over your property. But you need to keep it in decent shape. You should keep your house in decent repair. Because it's good for you in this life. It's good to witness to the people around you. You don't have to, though, go deep in debt to have it just picture perfect all the time and spend a lot of your labor and other people's labor and a lot of money and paint it every other year or anything like that. It's not about show. It's about substance. And we should do it when we do it to the best of our ability. You know, when I was six and I mowed the yard, I left uh, mohawks fairly often, that little strip of grass that, uh, you know, went between one stripe and another, or you ran over it both times with the wheels, and then, you know, an hour later, it's standing up and going, I'm here, you know, and Dad taught me and sent me back out to mow the mohawks off. And, um... Within, you know, a year or two, I got really good at mowing it without that. And mowing it in such a way that there weren't um, rows of mowed off grass clippings piled up. They mulched in, or I swept them up or something. Bagging was fairly common then, too. And... You know, I did what was a presentable job. And as 
and learned to do it uh, mainly on the next door neighbor's lot. And she was paying me a whole dollar a week to mow once a week. Um, of course, in the early 60s, that was a lot of money for a kid. And um, I thought I was getting rich. But I also learned how to serve the other and make them feel like they were uh, getting a good thing. And that led when I started deciding, you know, I want to earn more money. Your yard needs mowing, can I mow your yard? There's my coin prize. And pretty soon they would see my workmanship, my quality, and go, hey, I like that. And I got several customers from, you know, I'd be mowing a yard and somebody would drive up and go, I see you mowing his yard and I always like how it looks. Would you come down and mow my yard? How much do you charge? And I'd tell them, oh, that's a fair price. Yeah, you know, three houses down, two houses down, uh, or next door, uh, whatever. And I was like, okay, if you're in the same neighborhood, I'll do it the same day I'm doing today. You know, I'll, you know, so it's a Tuesday evening. I'll be doing it on Tuesday every day, every time a week, because getting there and mowing everybody in the same neighborhood made sense. And, you know, people came to like that. And then as I study scripture, it's what the Proverbs tell you to do. And it's just good customer skills. But it's also what Christ will prompt you to do if you're doing it for him. At that time, I was doing it for, you know, $5 bill. Today, if I was mowing somebody else's lot, I'd be doing it so that they would know Christ loves them. And we should be working even if we're, you know, at our jobs, uh, we're, yeah, we're working for a paycheck. Let's face it, I enjoy what I do for a living, but if they didn't pay me, I don't enjoy it enough to go do it for free. Yes, I want to do my best for Jesus uh, and make sure he uh, is well represented and uh, his people are known as hard workers and, uh, you know, doing it ethically and honestly and uh, with vigor. But on the other hand, um, if they walked in and said, yeah, we've decided we're not paying anybody. Uh, we want you to come to work tomorrow and uh, continue to do the same quality job. I might come in tomorrow hoping that God would change their mind, but I'd also be out looking for a new job because I've got bills to pay. And if you're not paying me, I'm not here long term. But if you're paying me, particularly if you're paying me a decently fair living wage, I should put in and work for you like I was working for God. And if I do that in my life, I've found that just doing it like I was doing it for Jesus very often puts me above everybody else and the bosses won't promote me and won't me doing my job and they hold me up as, the, as an example of how to do things and bosses that weren't Christian get to hear my Christian witness that I'm doing it because I'm doing it for Jesus and they look around and see the ones who aren't Christians are they're lazy, dishonest, unethical, and their Christians are these honest, ethical, hardworking. It gives a testimony. They have all kinds of reasoning about why they shouldn't, but it's just rationale. They see the evidence that Jesus affects how you are.
And that's what Paul's getting at here. If we live like we were living for Jesus every day in everything we do, whether it's getting up and fixing breakfast for our family, or it's doing the laundry, or going to work and doing your job at work, or mowing the lawn, or you know, exercising to stay healthy, or whatever it is you're doing. And even your entertainment. Then the people around you will see a difference. And God will be pleased with you. Lord, help us to be people who honor you. That we intentionally work with the Holy Spirit to put on the gift of the fruit of the Spirit that we will be loving and kind and self-controlled and gentle and accepting. That we will be hard-working and good, honest, ethical people that are a good example for the world. Lord, have us to be peaceable people particularly with fellow believers, and that we will, even when we think they're wrong, still seek to cooperate with them and love them and get along with them, that the world would see your people are united, even when we have divisions within us. Lord, help us to be those honest, hard-working people that work at doing good. That we would be good witnesses for you. Work through us. Mold us into your image. In your holy name. Amen. I'm your host, Frank Reich, Associate Pastor of Family and Ministry at Grace Fellowship Baptist Church. And uh, this was recorded on Monday, uh, November 6th, 2023, and uh, I hope to see you Wednesday at the Bible study. If not, uh, I hope to see you Sunday. Uh, Oscar will preach his last uh, sermon on old uh, hymns, and um, I look forward to it. Uh, I know a little bit about what's going on, being in the praise team and uh, where we're going, and uh, I anticipate Another great sermon, and uh, I hope I got to see you Sunday afternoon at the uh, Fall Festival. Uh, it was uh, a fun time. I got to visit with a lot of people and got to see lots of people, and uh, if not, I'll see you here on YouTube. You have a blessed week.